We're going to take a little look at the actual history of the computer. I have a nice little Prezi that I found here put out by a gentleman named Justin Zhao. I thank you, Justin, for putting this together. Let's start off and talk about what exactly is a computer. As we go through our textbook here, we'll understand that certain things are considered a computer and other things are perhaps just considered a computing device. So for our definition, we're going to look at a computer as an electronic device, something that has a central processor that has, utilizes a complex set of instructions to perform whatever task that particular computer has been programmed to do. Now there are multiple kinds of computers. On the large end of things we have supercomputers which are tasked to do some very complex uh, computations. Then we have mainframes that are typically used in larger corporations, government. And on the smaller end of things we have the personal computers that you and I are used to using as well as alternate manifestations of those personal computers that we would call laptops, netbooks, tablets, smartphones, you know, might be a computer on your wrist that's monitoring your heart rate. There's a lot of different kinds of computers these days. So as we begin to dive into the computer world, we're going to look at how computers work. We're going to look at this control unit, generally no more commonly as the CPU, the central processing unit. That's what interprets the actual instructions, the heart of the computer. Then there are the supplementary processors that go along with the CPU that have dedicated functions. In this particular case, he's talking about mathematical calculations, numeric coprocessor. There are graphics processors that are dedicated to doing graphical uh, calculations. Then there is the actual memory. The memory is used to store a lot of different information. RAM is an acronym that means random access memory. ROM means read-only memory. One of the differences there is that random access memory, or RAM, is dynamic. It means when you turn the power off, you lose all of the information that's in the RAM. Whereas read-only memory, also known as static memory, does maintain its value when the power is turned off. And lastly, in order to actually get information in and out of the computer, we're going to look at and concern ourselves with input-output devices. Chapter 2 will deal with the human computer interface and the ways that we do utilize that, whether it's through a keyboard, a microphone, a mouse, many different ways we get information into the computer. Output can be spoken, audio, it can be visual off of a screen. Again, there's multiple ways to get information in and out of a computer. Let's look at what computers can do. We have certain preconceived notions about common things that the computers can do. Word processing, something we're going to do a fair amount of in this class. Internet access, again, we'll do a lot of that. We will explore some of the intricacies of digital video and audio. We'll get into some mathematical calculations and dealing with binary numbers. And of course, there's all of the other interesting things like online banking, weather analysis, when you travel, you know, the entire reservation system that the airline industry operates off of, the business that you do today, whether you're taking your test, some of your tests may be completely electronic. And of course, speaking on the phone these days tends to be a completely digital experience. So who actually invented the computer? Well, there's a couple of differentiations we would make here. First of all, there's a fellow by the name of Charles Babbage who is generally associated with the one who came up with the idea of computational machines. He never actually built one, although he did come up with some great ideas. J. Von Neumann is the one who is generally credited with the modern computer design in the sense that it's an electronic device that can store the data and you put all of the program information onto a memory chip. And then Mr. Roberts generally considered the pioneer of the first personal computer. 
Some other people of note, uh, Mr. Hollerith, who the textbook talks about, generally credited with the first production application of digital information. He utilized the punch card scenario to take an information processing system that was very slow, done by hand, the census of the United States, and then he automated that through the use of punch cards. A process that took eight years to complete was reduced to one year. So that's a significant step forward in automation. However, technically that still was not a computer. It was a calculating machine, an electrical mechanical device. So it was all hardware, built out of wires, rollers, and motors. There was no software. So in order to change it, you would have had to rewire it. The first digital electronic computer made a total change in that scenario. Uh, Alan Turing, by the way, was one that's generally credited with coming up with the idea of the Turing test. And it's one of the ways that they test whether or not a computer happens to have any artificial intelligence, which so far none of them have. And then also noted here, of course, some of our modern pioneers like Steve Jobs and created Apple and Bill Gates, who founded Microsoft. So why? You know, why did the chicken cross the road? Why was the computer invented? Well, people have always wanted to calculate with numbers. And automating a process that's very tedious is generally a, a productive sort of a occupation. So in the areas of business, we find tremendous improvements in record keeping systems, input of words, administrative processes, the military uses computers extensively these days. I think, you know, throughout your daily life, you'll see a tremendous range of ideas of how computers are used to improve our lives. So what did the computer play as far as a role in history? One of the things that was significant about the computer was developed during the war. It improved a great deal of our military planning procedures. Here you can see an example of a machine called the Colossus and another encryption machine called Enigma, I should say Enigma, that was used to break codes. So how has the computer evolved over time? Essentially they have become smaller and faster, more reliable, easier to manage, more personal, and more energy efficient. That says a lot right there. The first generation of computers, like I said, they were really more electromechanical devices. It wasn't until into the 30s that we began to build the first electronic computers, and those were created using vacuum tubes. The Colossus and the ENIAC were developed during that period of time. The ENIAC is pictured on page six of our textbook. So the reliability of those and the programmability of those was particularly difficult. The second major improvement came with the invention of the transistor. These were invented in the 60s and these became basis, the basis for all computers. One of the things that is important that you understand as we move forward is the switch to transistors was very, very significant. It solved many of the really tough problems that were facing computer engineers trying to build computers. The transistors, and imposed to the vacuum tubes, had a lot lower power. They didn't generate as much heat. They were very reliable, and they were very small in size and weight. Still, they required a lot of assembly, and it was tedious to build all of these boards with hundreds of transistors on them. The third age, the age of the integrated circuit, the one that we are in today, was a tremendous transition and a subject of another little video that we're going to look at that allowed a single circuit to incorporate 
hundreds and thousands and billions and eventually even billions of transistors onto a single chip. And these were some of the things that I pioneered the internet and the World Wide Web. Here's a little graphic showing the evolution of the computer, starting off with an abacus, moving up into Babbage's difference machine, uh, the Berry computer, Colossus, the ENIAC, all the way down to the IBM PC. We're going to skip over this little video here. So what about today? What are computers like today? You'll note over on the left the computer manufacturing companies that are listed here. These are what we would generally refer in the industry to as Tier 1, T-I-E-R, Tier 1 companies that make computers. These are highly engineered, custom designed computers. They're the most popular things that you'll see today in the business world. This happens to mention prices. You'll see that they've become quite affordable uh, compared to what they used to be. So how does the computer impact our life? Well, we've become extraordinarily dependent on the computer. It's amazing when the computers stop working how much general work and life just ceases to be. We have the internet, which is a huge worldwide system of internet or interconnected computers. All of these things came about more or less in about the 90s, 1990s, when the computer usage began to explode. Interestingly, in the 2013 census, there were more than 2.4 billion internet users worldwide. That's a lot of people. And that concept is going to change as we begin to think about the Internet of Things versus people. Typically, it has been people using the Internet. Soon, that's not going to be the case. It's going to explode exponentially with the Internet of Things, and that will be a topic that we'll look at a little bit later. So they're very important. They're a huge part of our economy and our culture and you can get a, a lot of jobs out there dealing with the computer world. The first computers were really people that performed calculations. That has eventually transitioned. Now we have calculators and we have computers and we don't really think of people being computers. They are embedded in almost everything we have today. And the, progress has been somewhat staggering. Interesting statistic here about the one gigabyte hard disk. That same one gigabyte, well, today a thumb drive could easily have 64 gigabits and lay and weigh less than one ounce and cost 20 bucks. If you have a garage, you might be in competition someday with some of these key players in the market. All of those folks, HP, Google, Microsoft, and Apple, all of them started in garages. The last statistic is a bit sad. And, uh, over 6,000 computer viruses are released each month. Unfortunately, it is still a wild, wild west out there in the terms of computer security. <clears throat> 